All right, so the, so my son's in ninth grade, and he joined the. Cl- it's not part of a class; it's a club. So he joined. Obviously, he joined the stock market club. He's embarrassed to tell people who his father is, which is funny. <laughs> um, but some some of the kids in in the club know. They want me to come speak, and he's oh, like, yeah. "I will literally not go to school that day if you come to my school." Yeah. So the nugget. So the nugget is in this uh, in this stock market co- competition. So I'm teaching him like what to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is the funniest thing ever. First of all, his biggest position is NVIDIA. So there today you know. I am like number one dad on earth. Um, but I was teaching him. So he has, t- uh, it's a three month competition. You can buy, you could sell and you could sell short. And there's leverage, which I find, which I find oh, to be hilarious. We didn't have that in our day. Okay. No. This game is on the internet and it's sponsored by SIFMA, which is the securities industry, financial <laughs> market. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Something, whatever the A is of America, yeah. but it's an industry thing. So, so anyway, he's like, Dad, I have a hundred thousand dollars. I could do whatever I want. Yep. What should I do? So I start going. Oh, let's maybe do a little bit of uh, Disney, and let's maybe sell short uh, super micro computer. He's like, What do you mean maybe? Like, tell me what to do so yeah. I could win. I'm like, <laughs> Well, I don't know. It's not that simple. I don't know what's going to happen. He's like, What do you even do? It's it's so much worse than that. He's like, explain to me, don't you do this all day and yeah. like on TV? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but dude. They'll put anyone on TV. Yeah. I'm like, dude, <laughs> there's too many options. Like you could literally do anything. It's a blank canvas. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I don't know what to tell you to do because not only do, do the things that we do have to work out, they have to work out like before April 30th. Or, oh, okay. Right. So I don't like really know, not that I could help if we're May 30th. So- I start like giving him advice and half the things go up, half the things go down. And he's like, you really don't know anything, do you? I'm like, no, <laughs> he's, he can't believe he's like, he's like stunned because if it were, let's say it were like a baseball competition mm-hmm. and his dad was Derek Jeter, like he would probably be getting really good pointers yeah. on how to win this, this like a competition, like how to hit and feel the baseball. He'd probably win. I can't help him do any better than any other kid in this contest. So I've got a 16-year-old daughter, and she thinks I'm pretty useless at most things. Right. My, my, my 13-year-old son's getting there, I guess. So I've still got an 11-year-old. He likes me, but, you know, we're, we're getting there. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting there. So it, I guess it's— Does she pay attention to what you're doing um, in, in like, with market stuff or not yet? My daughter? Yeah. Not really no. at all. Although I get the, the green light when she needs money, if that counts the same. You know. But she's not like, uh, hey, Dad, I saw you were on I saw you were on CNBC today. Or the, I mean, it is so late, probably like with you. When I'm on CNBC, they don't even know. I'm like, I'm on TV in one minute. Get, keep the dog quiet. They yeah. don't care. My kids I mean, I've done it so many times. I had a proud yeah. down yeah. moment in the elevator. Oh. We were going up to the room, and we walk in, and one of the, the guy in the elevator goes, Michael, love everything that you guys do. I was like, oh, thank you, Joe. And... Uh, we walk down and Kobe goes, are you famous? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's me. You are. Did you tell? Did you say yes? I hope you said yes. Uh, you definitely didn't. I don't think I said yes. Okay. I'm pretty sure I didn't say yes. I've had a few times people walk up to me and say something because they know me from what I do. And my kids usually just think I paid the guy to say that. Enough but, about us. Yeah. 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 Like literally. Yeah. Listen to this. All right. Revenue of $22.1 was up 22% sequentially and up 265% year on year. And well above our outlook of $20 billion. For fiscal 2024, revenue was 60.9 billion and up 126 percent nice. from the prior year. Starting with data center, data center revenue for the fiscal 2024 year was 47.5 billion, more than tripling from the prior year. The world has reached the tipping point of new computing era. The trillion dollar installed base of data center infrastructure is rapidly transitioning from general purpose to accelerated computing. I, mean, I know that's a real person, but why does she herself sound like AI is power I ha- in her voice? Because I'm sorry. I have it on 1.5 times speed. That's my bad. Okay. Mm-hmm. But she said, the world has reached a tipping point of new computing era. I would have said that happened a year ago. I guess it's first happening now. That's, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the big takeaway is that it seems to be that uh, I think Jensen Wang made two really good cases uh, during during his remarks. One is – all of the old infrastructure is basically worthless and obsolete, and we have to start all over again. That's like a really big build. <laughs> I don't a- think that that's what most people expected. No. Okay. That's a big one. The second one is now this is going to be a services story. Mm-hmm. And they very deliberately are pivoting the conversation away from how many GPUs can this company possibly sell to don't worry about the GPUs because now we're selling enterprise services to the whole installed base. And 
there are NVIDIA GPUs in every data center all over the world. And everywhere that we've put our equipment will now require software and services. So that's kind of what Apple did with the iPhone a couple of years ago. He said, don't count how many units we sell. It doesn't matter. We're a services business. The installed base is the units. Now focus on how much revenue we generate based on that installed base. So that makes NVIDIA maybe different than a chip company. It does. I mean, you think about it, you know, the old saying, surprises in a bull market happen to the upside. And we're talking to NVIDIA, I know, but it's like truly a couple of other, I guess the guy at the table said up 15% the day of. Not I to guess, brag. Yeah, not to brag. But most people said, ah, stock's up a lot. It's, it's, yeah. it's dicey. And sure enough, no. And then you see the net incomes up 900% the past year. Well, maybe the stock up a lot makes a lot of sense because they're making a lot more yeah, money. Maybe, it's, it's so, maybe yeah. sometimes the whole world isn't completely crazy. Jensen was asked, like, uh, how their expectations for a data center has evolved. And he said, you, we guide one quarter at a time, but fundamentally, the conditions are excellent for continued growth, calendar 24 to calendar 25 and beyond. They literally can't make, they cannot make the products fast Still, enough. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I do yeah. think that as much as this particular earnings quarter was hyped, it, it was worth the hype because had NVIDIA shit the bed, and the stock went down 18%, it would have taken the market down with it. All of the enthusiasm for all of the other Mag7 names, the air would have come out of the balloon. Yesterday, people were mocking CNBC for having a countdown yeah. on the screen right. for NVIDIA earnings. It was, it was, it was, the stock's important. up a hundred, the stock's up a hundred dollars today. I mean, do you think the countdown was, wor was, was merited or not? Looking back, I mean, is today your actual birthday? Is no. Okay. My birthday is Sunday. Okay. So, but it's still, it's kind of your birthday. How old do you think I'm turning? Oh, you're, well, I think you're one year older than me. So you're either 46 or 47. Oh, you, oh so you know. Well, okay. I just know what how old I am. Are we I the have same, one year. we're the same gen? I'm 44. I thought right I was now. old. I thought I was a lot older than you. Well, I you're just, 40. I just look young. You're 44. You're born in 80, 81. No, no, no. Uh, 78. How the f 44? What are you talking about? Hashtag five, math. I don't know. This is amazing. Wait, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get to the bottom of this. Pull this, pull this guy's uh, birth certificate. <laughs> it's 78. I know that much. Mid You're right. I guess I have 45. 1977. Yeah. I only make I make up numbers all the time on TV. I'm doing okay. it again, apparently. I'm turning yeah. 47. I was born in 77. So there you go. So I'm, I'm turning 46 in. That, there it was. So. You just said you were 44. I'm 45. I'm wrong. <laughs> what is your real name, sir? <laughs> I'm 45, I swear. Yeah. I forgot how old I am. All right. When you get to a certain age, that's proof, right? Yeah. Well, Ro Rob's so old, he forgot he was at somebody's wedding. That's right. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Did that last week? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we ready? All right. Hey, John, what episode is this? Friends, episode one. Today's show is brought to you by investing platform, public.com, which just launched options trading. In an industry first, public is sharing 50% of its options revenue directly with you, the customer. So when you trade options on public, you actually are getting some dollars back. That's pretty cool. It's a more transparent approach to options with no fees and you get something back on every single trade. Go to public.com and activate option trading by March 31st to lock in your lifetime rebate. This was paid for by Public Investing. Must activate options account by March 31st for revenue share. Options not suitable for all investors and carry significant risk. Full disclosures and podcast description, U.S. members only. Episode 151, welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Compound and Friends. Episode 151, thank you, John. Wait, what's the Star Wars one? 131. You'll find out. When you is that find out. Yo, don't, don't make me show you what it is. Uh, hey, guys. This is a show I've been looking forward to for a really long time. We happen to... 131. It's 131. What? What did he 151. say? 151. A lot of numbers are off today. What is it? Wait. 131. It's 131. All right, start everything all over. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, our audience has been looking forward to this. Yeah. Every, you're our most requested guest. Everyone's like, when are, you gonna, so. when are you going to have Dietrich on? Oh I swear to God. Oh, boy. Let me give you my, let me give you my, my intro that I wanted to give you. Uh, okay. You are, look deeply into my eyes. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> you are, in my estimation, among the finest of all of the quantitative and technically oriented people following the markets. Not just because you're right a lot more than you're wrong, at least from what I can tell, uh, but because of how 
illustrative you are when explaining the things that you follow and why you think they're important. You have that gift. But more than that, you're a good person. There are a lot of people who are as smart as you and they're dicks and they're nasty and they 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 do I told you so games. You're like a good guy. So I root for you and you make me money and I appreciate your friendship and I'm so happy to have you on the show. Well, I'm just going to so, leave now, Josh. No, no dude, dude I mean right. every word. I yeah. truly mean every word of it. Michael well, doesn't you. like you that much. Stop. But I said, Even we're going to have Ryan. We're getting Ryan. I don't care what you say. All right. Uh, we're, you know that the two of us are huge fans. Right. I want to talk really quickly about your career trajectory. So I think I met you at a Lindsay Palooza event or a Stocktoberfest event. Does that, does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. 2014 okay. or 2015, probably okay. around then. Okay. So, yeah, I got the bug in 99. Okay. Um, Xavier University. Well, you, were you, you were either 12 or 16 then? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah, these numbers, these make up numbers. It is episode 131, everybody. I, I know that much. Okay. Um, and I am 45. Okay. But yeah, I got the stock market bug in 99, and I always loved numbers, and just, I was hooked, right? I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I made a lot of money on the way up, and lost money, a lot of money on the way down. And then I realized, oh, I could have made money on the way down, and, and that was what I wanted to do. Okay. So I, I did a couple different smaller jobs out of college, worked for an options newsletter for about 10 years, give or take, in Cincinnati, started doing the media stuff. We were bullish coming out of the financial crisis. So I was on TV all the time because nobody was bullish for many, many years. People forget that. They really weren't. And then I started leveraging social media, and that's how we all were connected. Okay. You know, we always had our first Phil conversation, right? Phil yes. Perlman. And, and then— um, Met at, you know you're going to see Phil tonight, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, look forward yeah. to that. Um, he's going to walk up to you. He's going to go, yeah! <laughs> he's exactly. going to be so excited. That's what he's going to do. Okay. And, and, you know, then it kind of went around, and I wanted to work more with people, wanted to work more managing money, worked at RAA for a minute in Cincinnati. They were bought out 30 days later, so I was okay. I was out yeah, of the job. That wasn't helpful. No, but then I realized someone that I'd met at a conference um, – a year or two before at Howard's conference that I, at the time I didn't have any money and Howard flew me out on his own dollar to, to his conference, which you was really, no, I'm dead serious. Howard's really, a bunch. Howard, yeah. Howard hooked me up a big time and, and directly because of his generosity, get me out there. Someone I met hooked me up with somebody else. And he did named, the same thing for me. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, our, stories are, story. our stories are similar. Yeah. And I met someone named Bert White, who was a big, uh, oh, one of sure. the main guys at LPL. Shout hired to, me. To Bert. Yeah, Bert's awesome. He's mentoring a friend and he hired me at LPL, worked there for six years, six and a half years, had a lot of fun. And then Bert left to go work for Carson Group, mm -hmm. uh, which RA based in Omaha, where almost 50,000 families served and about, well, I'm going to make these numbers correct, I swear, $34 billion in uh, assets. And and I, I saw what Bert was doing. I said, ooh, that looks kind of fun. You know, I mean, it, go go work somewhere. What's the, big um, what's the biggest, so uh, yeah. what's the biggest difference between Carson Group? I know you're, you're sort of in the same role. Yeah, same role. But what's the biggest difference culturally from LPL to Carson Group? Yeah, Carson just, uh, you know, quote unquote, smaller. Right, not so institutional. So you wanna, you Thirty-two wanna, billion. Yeah, 30, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, 34, 34, 34 billion. billion. But you want you want to get something done, you just do it, right? And and you have the the the, the, the trust in you and the and it's an RIA. It's, it's not a RIA. it's not a, a broker dealer. It's correct. Not a it's an okay. RIA. Ron Carson started it in nineteen eighty three in his dorm room, the University of yeah, Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So, so it's just yeah. So it's 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 been a it's been an interesting career, ups and downs, fired, laid off, all types of stuff. But it's funny how you know it is true. One door closes, another door opens. And I've been at Carson for about a year and a half. Well, it'll be two years this July. July and uh, just loving it. It's, it's, it's a blast. Congratulations. We're, yeah. we're, uh, we're big fans of Ron's and so much respect for uh, the firm that he's built. And, yes. you know, that's, I, I think it's great for you. I, I think a lot of things happen uh, for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you think the same way. So some of those earlier gigs that you were in, they weren't meant to be your career. They right. were just meant to be somewhere where you learn something that you take with you to the next thing. So it's good that you, it's good that you have that attitude too. Yeah, exactly. So uh, how did you hit upon your style? Because yeah, as I mentioned yeah. in my intro, you are looking at market history and technicals, and you said uh, seasonality and mm -hmm. sentiment, which uh, we're going to talk about all that stuff. Sure. Uh, you also will listen to people that come from a discipline that you don't, like global macro. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a melange of different uh, types of ways to, to view the market, and you combine them, I think, in a really – interesting and thoughtful way. Is that, was that accidental or did you say, I want to add all of these skill sets to my repertoire until it's something bigger? Uh, like, wh what's your, what's your, like your history in, in, in that sense? 
So I started, I just had my 15 year anniversary on Twitter slash X. I got that alert. So I started, so I, I think I learned a lot from social media back in the day because I would share a tweet and you'd see it was popular. What I found was popular was when I said, hey, the last four times this happened, X, Y, Z happened next, or the last 15 times this happened, what happened next? Give some statistics, give some some stats and some numbers. And then read it. the replies. Uh, what's that? And then read the replies. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Read the replies and read the likes and see if it works, you know, and, and I learned real quickly that telling stories. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I've learned so much. Social media is like a cheat sheet, right? You just see smart people and you follow them. And, and I've learned so much. It's like Sam Stovall, right? I mean, Sam's amazing. I saw Stan present many years ago and he told stories and he told jokes and, yeah. and it was so cool. I've seen really great presenters. And it's like really boring. And you walk out like, oh, that was kind of boring. But but I kind of took little bits from piece, people like that. And then I got pretty good with Excel and just, um, you know, just following the markets and finding little things. I mean, you know, silly, like people love the silly stuff, you know? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think I sent it, sent it to you guys. But like when Philadelphia wins a championship, bad things happen. I joke that's why the market was up, you know, yeah, last year. Mike sends me yeah. that shit. He goes, yeah. can you believe this <laughs> shit Ryan's writing? Uh, <laughs> well, I said a lot more than just that. The but, silly stuff, yeah. the silly stuff will get you booked. Like you will get, yeah. you will get on Bloomberg TV or Yahoo Finance because you say like the Valentine's Day indicator. Mm -hmm. Like you, that's fine. But then you have There's like meat to it. You yeah. have a lot of depth. No, but you, so you that. do the silly stuff, but that's obviously as you know, it's it's silly. What you do that I love is I am a big believer in long term market psychology yeah. data because it is just purely behavioral, and I don't care how many machines are running today or how much money is in index funds, the behavior of market participants will never change. Right. So when you get washouts and the breath ruts and the last 13 times it happened. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a thousand years worth of data, but to me, that shit is powerful and meaningful. And it kept you credit mm -hmm. to you yeah. on the right side of a lot of this in 2023. What year is it? Yeah. In 2023, when everybody was, was, or going into 2023, right. when everybody was bearish, you saw the washout and yeah. you, you stayed bullish. You're right. I mean, you think about it. I mean, your average bear market without a recession is about 25%. Well, we had that bear market in 2022 at 24%. It never feels like it's enough. Never enough. It, never, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. But then you see also, well, <laughs> six of the last 18 bear markets bottom in October. Oh, by the way, midterm Mid years under a first-term president usually do poorly. And any one of these by themselves, okay, sure. But then when you stack them on top of each other and this stuff that JC talks about, like, you know, I mean, there were less new lows in October of 22 versus in June of 22. So there's some strength internally. Yeah, the headlines were terrible, but we saw that strong fourth quarter and we were one of the few places that said, Hey, I was going to say, you know, what else, you know what else you yeah. had on your side? You could probably, it would, it would be very difficult for you to find anyone to agree with you. Um, we were hated. Yeah. People hate people were mad. Why people were angry well, why do you most think that, of last year when we why were do you, Polish. Why do you think that is like, not people within Carson, like people that sure, don't even, you're right. people that have no, that have no stake in anything mm -hmm. that you're saying. Why is it why is it so triggering when you're <laughs> bullish and, and others are bearish? That is a great question. I mean, it, it feels I think you know because you're going against what everybody else is saying that tribal mentality potentially. Um, you know, maybe some people truly didn't feel good because of all the social media and all the negativity we have. But it it really was amazing to me, and it, it's hard. No, you know why I mean, people don't like to be told things are going to get better true. when it feels like they're going to get worse. Uh -huh. I actually think it's slightly different than that, and I wrote something and deleted it. Because it would have been really dangerous for me to publish this. So I'm just going to say it into a microphone. There you go. Uh, I'm not going to go really far in depth, but I wrote 2,000 words on this uh, last summer. Uh, oh, last, yeah, last summer after the market had been up for like six months. I think, I think it's, it's crabs, in a, crabs in a barrel. So there's this weird phenomenon where you fill a barrel with like 100 crabs. They will start climbing on top of each other. And one of them will eventually get to the wall and start pulling itself out. And for, for reasons that scientists like still are unclear of, the other crabs will latch onto it and pull it back down. Hmm. Now, some scientists think that the crab is trying to not pull it down, but like, like leap, leapfrog it, like use it for leverage to get itself higher and get out of the barrel. But other scientists say, no, this is just straight up antisocial behavior. It doesn't exist elsewhere in the animal uh, kingdom. We don't really have a good reason for why crabs will pull themselves back pull each other repeatedly back down into the barrel. I think there's one other place in the animal kingdom where that exists, and I think it's financial Twitter. Yeah. I think people who are unhappy with the state of their careers, people who have bills that are too high or have not found that special someone or their career is stuck in a rut, I think it really pisses them off when other people are making money 
or going public or having success or whatever. And so I think there's this tendency in the commentary to just shout down anything that might look remotely positive amongst those people. Now, the thing with those people is they over-index on Twitter because quite frankly, if things are going great in your life, you don't have time to spend 10 hours a day commenting on everyone else's opinions. So I think there's some element of it when Ryan Dietrich comes out and says, actually, guys, it's a bull market. These people are like, oh, you know what, Dietrich, screw you. Yeah. What do but you mean it's, it's a bull market? usually worse than that, what they say. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Mid <laughs> in, in Midwestern parlance, screw there you. Go. you. There you go. So I think there's a really big element of that. And that's where the behavioral stuff that Michael was referencing becomes more than just crowd psychology. It almost becomes like the more you listen to individual people, the more in danger you are of hearing an opinion that really has nothing to do with the market and everything to do with the person sharing that opinion. And it becomes really important to not have negative people in your life. So that's, that's, the, two, that's the distillation of a 2,000 word post that I'm not going to hit publish on. Um, but I have witnessed this firsthand, yeah. like over 10 years on social media. I've seen a lot of it. Don't, I, yeah, I, those are good points that I agree with. I also think that being bullish in a bear market, it makes you, or even, or if we're coming out of a bear market or whatever, you look reckless. And I think people think like, don't tell me to buy stocks or get bullish. Are you trying to, like, are you intentionally trying to lose me money? Right. I think it looks reckless. Here, you ignored some stuff. You ignored the yield curve. You ignored leading economic indicators, which were screaming recession. You didn't seem overly focused on M2. Right. Uh, why were you able to not uh, worry about those things where so many people uh, seem to be like very myopically focused on them? Yeah, I mean, those, boy, every day. Every day you turn TV on, someone's talking about L you know, LEI, negative. Yeah, right? probably me. Well, well. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, everybody was talking about it. Um, but, you know, what we were saying was we looked at different things. I mean, we looked at real incomes, right? Last year, this, right now, last year, this time, real incomes, that's incomes, take away inflation. We're making all-time highs. I mean, mm. people were making more money. We said, listen, inflation's probably going to come back. We, we, we thought a lot of reasons inflation's going to come back. We saw that. We, saw, we all know the consumer makes up 70% of the economy. There were some real positives there. I mean, we, we just didn't see these big worries. And yes, M2 was out there and the yield curve, um, you know, but we've written and talked about it. You guys have had people on talk about these things. It, it, they just, they were there, but the real hard data, you know, I mean, look at the, the uh, manufacturing surveys. Now, maybe they're finally above 50 for the first time in forever, but look at the hard data. I mean, literally manufacturing is up about one and a half percent the last year. Now, I'm not saying that's a ton. I'm just saying, but if you look at the surveys, what the people feel, it was just wildly different. You're a good news is good news guy. I think I hope so. Because yeah. here's here's how I could tell. If you were looking at real incomes making all time highs, um, so so wages minus inflation. Mm -hmm. Right. If you were looking at that as a good news is good news person, you would say, why are you talking about a recession? People are making more money than ever, even net of higher cost of living. If you're a good news is bad news person, yeah. meaning you're more worried about the Fed than you are about people actually doing well, yeah. then you would look at that and you would say that's evidence that inflation is not coming down fast enough. Right. So it's really funny to me how two different people could see the same data point and interpret it bullishly or bearishly depending on what they wanted to, to do because we all had that choice. Right. So, so that's an interesting thing where you could be looking at the same data as someone else, but just getting a different output yeah. from how you think about and it. And I'll say this, I mean, I share a lot of it on social media, but I look at a lot of different studies and it's people like, well, that's maybe bullish or that's maybe bearish, but, and it's hard to quantify it. I, it's just a feel I've done this for a while where there's just stacks so many, this time of year ago, I was stacking so many potentially positive things on top of them with, if everybody's thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking general Patton with everyone else was saying one thing, we just said, boy, the opportunity, literally the second line of our outlook that came out, you know, beginning of January last year, we said we could hit new all-time highs this year. And people, I mean, Sounds I literally, crazy. I literally had a reporter, I don't say who, a reporter reach out to me and say, that's not true. You're, you're kidding, right? Like they, was they it was John, a, John Authors? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forget who it was. No, okay. I'll leave it there. But but yeah, I mean, it, it felt, you know, weird. But then like I talked about, and we, we know these cycles, these cycles work, the seasonality stuff, it tells a story. But hey, you know, the, on average, we knew a year ago, when you have a first-term president pre-election year, you know what the stock market does? Gains about 20% on average. I mean, we knew that. And when you're down the year before and up 5% in January, the rest of the year is up like 27% on average, never been lower. We knew these things a year ago right now. People ignored them. And, you know, we didn't. We were over at equities. I want to ask you a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So you're on an RIA now. Yeah. RIAs are 95% or more long only. 
um, mm-hmm. you probably can't be the guy that's going to see the downturn coming, or maybe you can be, but even if you think it's going to be bad, you probably can't speak of it in those terms. And I know this from, from experience mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, Barry Ritholtz and I uh, have talked a lot about this. Barry became famous as the guy who saw yeah. the 07, 08 top mm-hmm. and then the crash and then went positive. But like, not only do I not think he could do it again and neither does he, I won't let him. Yeah. So, you know, is there some, is there some like uh, element to that where most of the time you're probably going to default to a more constructive outlook just because by virtue of what you're trying to help people do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's probably true. I mean, we could go to even weight equities. We're even weight equities you know, for most of That's 2022. That's as you get even weight. Yeah, so far in my career, I guess. I mean, since, yeah, since yeah. Bit Carson. I mean, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's other things you can do, but you're probably right. And we know this, Belsky, you guys had a great conversation. I'm not too yeah. different than him. Markets usually go up, right? That's and, right. And, 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 you know, I mean, I love the the seven-year itch, right? We've talked, people talked about this before. 1950, new bull market, seven years in, bear markets, seven-year itch, and then market went up for another 11 years. 1980, made new highs. Add seven to that, 87 crash, 13 more years of bull market. Oh, you like the seven year I love I love it because okay. I mean, I've been talking about it for a while too. 2013, we broke out the new highs. Add seven, that's 2020. Bear market. I know we have two bear markets here, but I just think this this cycle has a lot more life to it. So, Josh, I hope to answer your question. Maybe you know we've got hopefully you, several more years of a good, strong market with the stronger economy. People think that we'll not have to worry too much about that quite yet. So I mean, I, we, how I'd answer we it. did the bear market. We two did. Of, we, we had two of them, 2020 <laughs> and 2022. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we had one, one was down. I mean, one didn't last long. So maybe you could throw that out. The second one was real. Oh, yeah. And NASDAQ in a 35% drawdown, S&P in a 25% drawdown. Mm-hmm. Small caps and it took, more. And it took, I guess what? And it De- took eight months. December 2018, we had one. It was only, it was only 19% or 19 point whatever. But people act like this has been like a one-way market for the mm-hmm. last decade. It just hasn't been. Yeah, returns well. have been stellar. Returns have been absolutely stellar, but it's not been that easy. No, it hasn't. I mean, just on the 10%. Pullback correction we had last year, right? 10.2% on October 27th. I shared this chart. You look at your average year, it bottoms on October 27th and then starts to rally into the end of the year. And that's just one data piece, I know. But, you know, we're hearing just, it's incredible the amount of fear we were seeing just on a 10% correction in the midst of a market that was up on the year last year. Then you have a 14% rally the final two months of the year, one of the best rallies ever. I looked when you gained 10% the last two months of the year. What happens next? January's never been lower, like six out of six times higher. And the next year has never been lower, higher, higher all Dude, the six media times. Goes, so, the media you know, goes zero to 60 yeah. on those 10%. Yeah. On those 10% oh, corrections. Fast. Yeah. They, like they don't wait for it to be down 11%. <laughs> as soon as it's down yeah. 10%. Publish. They're like, true. get me Ray Dalio. And Dalio will be on mm-hmm. Squawk and he'll be like, it's 1933. No, 37, dude. It's 37. <laughs> you always. wish it was 37. It's always 37. You know what? You know what's You're weird? gonna wish it was 37. We had, yeah. we had this real we had this like collision of the highest inflation that we've seen in decades with an incredible technological breakthrough that pushed earnings a lot higher than they otherwise would have been. To have those two forces bang into each other at the same time, it was a very unusual market environment, market and economic environment. Well, it was. I mean, I don't have too much more to add to there. I mean, you know, thank we, you. It was so it, profound. It was, it was so perfect. So, so you know, Cliff Josh, Josh, nice perfect, no, you missed all this. No, you, you, you had you, know, you had the nine percent inflation, and and we know it was supply chain driven. Was it really ever about demand? No, I mean, demand was always solid. We we kind of saw that. So, and now you've got the positives, and and like I talked about, you know, the, the idea that we thought we started the new bull. I think we started a new bull market twenty thirteen when we broke out, and the, again these cycles, these secular bulls last a while. You know, the surprises happen to the upside. And supported by fundamentals. There. And supported by fundamentals because earnings are How earnings. How beautiful is that? I mean, it's, they're, not, they're, it's not all multiple that's expansion. A, no, that's, that's not a, all multiple expansion That's a good all. segue. Mm-hmm. Let's, yeah, talk about, let's, let's talk about how the fundamentals have really supported mm-hmm. most of what's gone on here. Yeah. By the way, uh, Ryan, thank you for bringing a billion charts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you I set a record? I, I don't know. I mean— I think, No, 44 pages, that's a record. Okay. For the doc. You're Love welcome. It. You're, you're welcome. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, let's get into it. I don't know. It's what I do. So yeah. so this is NVIDIA, and you made the point that this is not multiple expansion. This is earnings growth uh, powering most of what we've seen. And if anything, it's negative multiple expansion because NVIDIA has actually been getting cheaper— yeah. As its earnings have been far outpacing its share price, if if you could even imagine that. What what multiple are we looking at here? Well, this is simply how much the stock has gone up since what what it's, 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 since the start of twenty twenty one, right? And you think about gains. Well, it's it's earnings. 
its dividends, and multiple expansion. Those are things. So, so we took a look at you know earnings. Earnings are up, it was 231 percent uh, since 2021. The start of 2021, the stock's up 130 percent. So you've actually had <laughs> earn, negative had, 102 you, percentage points in multiple. Yeah, multiple actually have gone down. So you know it's just incredible when you think about that. But you look at the other Mag Seven. That's what we're sharing here. The other Mag Seven, or well, six, I guess. A lot of the gains have come from earnings. And again, you know, maybe these stocks, I don't want to go against what you guys, last week, love last week's podcast, you guys talked about, you know, Mag 7 in a bubble. I'm not going against that necessarily. I still think it's a bubble. Yeah, I mean, I, I was gonna, that's what I was getting at. It, it feels a little bubblicious, but at least we're having some earnings coming in on it. And we're more neutral tech. I'm I very agree. Clear. We're more neutral tech. We're not underweight tech. We're more neutral. No, the, the, but at but least you have on, the earnings bubble. here. When you use the word bubble, in my opinion, I know we throw it around all the time. Yeah, yeah we do. In my opinion, that means that it there is almost no world in which economic reality can support the valuations that exist today. Right. And therefore, the stock must decline 70% for things to get so rational. I would, I would put it differently. There are, there are degrees of bubbles. And I, I, what I've been saying is that what separates this from 99 no, but so fine. is so, that this is reasonable, but I, I call it an activity bubble. So is it a bubble? Sure. But is yes. it really a bubble? Like a bubble bubble? It's not a speculative mania. It's an activity bubble in that Everyone has an opinion on these seven stocks. Everyone is trying to overweight them. Everyone is raising their targets on them. It's not for no reason. The fundamentals are f***ing great. It's just that the theme is becoming of nifty 50-esque proportions. Mm -hmm. Valuations definitely have not gotten there. They could. And on Tesla, I would argue they have. Yeah. Uh, on Meta, they're well on their way. Meta, To me, Meta looks like the one that's going to truly get into nosebleed uh, territory. So I look, I, I agree with the fat the premise. The rallies of these stocks, mm -hmm. the biggest stocks in the world, have been accompanied by amazing fundamental growth. Mm -hmm. I'm really just talking about how obsessed everyone's become with this group of stocks, and maybe bubble's the wrong way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should be maybe I should maybe I should come up with another way to say what I'm trying to say. I guess I don't I just think that NVIDIA is in a class of its own. I don't lump Google or Amazon. Or Apple, certainly not Apple. I mean, Apple's stock is not even doing well. I don't think Nvidia. individually. I don't think individually they they. Well, you kind of have to lump Microsoft with Nvidia because it's the biggest customer. But I, I get what, I get what you're saying. I think it's really the theme that's in a bubble more so than the individual stocks. Oh, that's, that's probably true. And then you think about how we're hearing it's only seven stocks going up, and we've pushed back against that literally last week. Yeah. The S&P 500 advanced decline line in all-time high. We like mid-caps a lot. If you talk about what's our biggest overweight bet, it's mid-caps, okay? Not many people talk about mid-caps. Mid-cap mid 400 AD line, all-time high. I mean, you think about that. Okay, well, that means there's probably a lot of stocks that are actually participating Why in this. Why do people say it's not that way? Don't know. That's well, a great question. it is true that the MAG-7 are driving the bulk of the index's gains. The gains. It's mm -hmm. also true that the equal weight NASDAQ 100 index today Mag is 7. at an all-time high. Yeah. So, yeah, the NASDAQ 100 was up – was it up 56% last year? Yeah, it was. There. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the equal weight was only up 20%. But it's not just seven stocks. It's that the seven stocks are just going up so much more than everything else. Yeah. And their earnings right. are growing so much faster right. than everyone else. And S&P 500 equal weight. I mean, I know I sent that chart. 50, I don't know 50 what, week high today. Literally 50, okay, I knew yeah. it was very Breaking close, out. I assume. Breaking so out. again, I'd be more worried if you're telling me the equal weights were 10, 15% away. Like, oh, okay, maybe it is just a few stocks. Those stocks matter. We know their earnings have come from there also. But there have been a lot of other positive places out there. And 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 we'd be, you know, again, I've got some other seasonality things. Maybe there could be a well-deserved break. We can get into that stuff. But just big picture, I, we just think, you know, this, this uh, economy is probably going to continue to surprise the upside, which keep this bull market going. We've said this for the last last year that if the RSP mm -hmm. yep. were to roll over yeah. and it was only the MAG-7, yes, that would be reason for concern. That hasn't happened yet. No. Well, you know, to a degree, I know it was very quick last week. I mean, tech was about the only group down last week. And look what happened. We had CPI hotter than expected, PPI hotter than expected, expectations for Fed cut rate cuts pushed back. Small caps and mid caps actually were green. You know, last this is week. a chart of. So, is this so for the audience who can't see that I'm holding this up? Is this going up or down or sideways? That is going up. If you ask me, straight up, straight, straight up. up. This is Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, yeah. There you go. Look Ber at financials. Berkshire Hathaway has a high, higher RSI than most stocks in the Nasdaq right now. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Sean 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 uh, Sean said it was 83 going into today. The stock is going straight up. <laughs> Based in <laughs> Omaha, same city as Carson. Josh was there talking about this company that makes um, the uniform for. Work genital workers, janitorial oh, I got, I got workers. In, I got in trouble for it, I said. 
What did you say? I said they make cleaning lady costumes. Okay, that's not <laughs> okay. nice. Well, there you go. Um, but Ridiculous. What the hell made me say that? You so, somebody was like, dude, you know, chill out with how you right. talk. Well, anyway, they make uniforms for workers. Mm-hmm. And the stock is at an all-time high. Which stock is it? Is the Sintas. Yeah, Sintas. They they're, make based, like, they're based in Cincinnati. That's what I thought you were going to say. It's a Cincinnati that's company. Why, that's where the scent comes from. Yeah, also, sometimes you wash your hands. They'll make some of the soap and the soap dispensers. The real they economy do is doing things, okay. But, that's yeah. the real economy mm-hmm. writ yeah. large. You right. know another one is? ADP. Yep. Look, at a ch- look at a chart of ADP. This thing looks like it's doing like AI biotech. That's like that's a stock that's about mm-hmm. to break out, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's yeah. do some. Let's do some of these. Let's do some of these funny charts. Um, why America wanted the Chiefs to win? Tell us what happened. Is this anytime a team whose mascot is a Native American uh, wins a championship? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not okay, going, not going to get in trouble. Like that. All right, no. Um, so <laughs> yeah, this, get was, this guy pinched. This was this was the. Uh, I'm, trying, know, I'm trying to piss Duncan off. Yeah, okay. All right, God. Yeah, no. Uh, this was again last Super Bowl when when it was the uh, the Chiefs versus the Eagles, and it was a playful one that when the Eagles, I'm sorry, when a team from Philadelphia, bad things happen. Athletics in 1910. You know, I, oh, I saw when you put this out originally. Yeah. yeah so I mean, and, and <laughs> I love athletics. The disclosure. The, we do not suggest ever investing based on who wins the World Series or Super you Bowl. You know, compliance. <laughs> they, they take away all the fun, but just yeah, you know, all these. This I mean, so 1929, 19. 30, 1980, Phillies won, recession, double dip. 2008, Phillies win, financial Oof, crisis. Not great. Sorry, can, um, I, can, I, can I narrate this for people? Yeah, go in, ahead. In 19, the Philadelphia Athletics, they went to Oakland eventually. Right. It was a Philly right. team. They were okay. a Philly team at the time, yeah. Uh, the Athletics won in 1929 <laughs> uh, and in 1930, which was the start of the Great Depression. They won in 1980. Uh, the Phillies won in 80, 08, and 2018. Uh, all right, so crisis averted this year. Yeah. No Phillies even in the Super Bowl. But y- you must have been rooting for the 49ers. Uh, I was. Yes. Yeah. As an AFC yeah. guy, as a yeah. Bengal fan, the Chiefs and Bengals have a healthy rivalry. Yeah. So and and I'm a Ohio State boy too. I didn't go there, but like Ohio State, they got a couple of Ohio State guys on the Niners. You think this such. kid you think this kid Burrow is like the future? He better be. He gave him yeah. a lot of money. But yes, he keeps getting hurt. Um he's, we need well, to he's protect not a big him. guy. Either. No, he's just he's very good, obviously. I mean, the few years he's played the whole season, they made the Super Bowl and the AFC championship. The yeah. problem is the other couple of years he hasn't made it to the end of the year. So yeah. I think he's good, just like anything, you gotta keep him keep him upright. Uh stocks do better under horned animals. Yeah, I thought what, is, what, what is this, this bullshit? I thought you'd love this one. Michael, you, uh, Michael, Michael, this one Michael's going to take back tra- my invite. He's trading on it yeah. either way. No, again, don't invest in this. Um, well, it's you're you're the you're the dragon. This right? is Chinese. It's the Chinese, the Chinese new zodiac. We just started the new and and uh, dragons Tom, sometimes Tom have Lee, horns. Tom Lee noted this. Maybe he might say it on TV, but he said you know you pronounce dragon long in Chinese. I didn't know that. So long is dragon in Chinese. But playfully, goats and ox. You're the goat and you're the ox are the two best years if you just look at the Chinese zodiac. Again, I'm aware. It's silly, but they have horns, and this is the year. Of the <laughs> no dragon. other animals on yeah. here have a horn. No, a dragon does, but dragons a little further to the right. Dragons uh, don't necessarily have horns. Not all of them. That's true. Some do. You're right. The um, uh, the JRR Tolkien dragons do not have horns. Don't they? Well, I don't think so. Chinese not, dragons. Don't, Chinese I don't know. Dragons. Do dragons have horns yeah. that you could? Th- I don't know. Figment uh, did. If you like, Figment, rat- oh, Figment did have caught did have horns. Oh. So I am getting more bullish. There you go. Uh, Rats and snakes <laughs> don't do as well historically. What so about again, the, the totally dragons in uh uh? What's the Marvel movie with the t- the Ten Rings that had dragons in it at the end? I don't know why that matters. All sure. right, let's do one more of these before uh, no, before let's Michael not, tunes out. No, I like this one. Let's do the if stocks are down the previous year. This trifecta is very bullish. Oh no, this is not bullshit. This is not. No, bullshit. this is bullshit. No, that's one. one. Yeah, we can skip that one. Yeah. This one. This is the one. All right. If stocks are down the right. previous year, this trifecta. What's the trifecta? So we shared this a year ago. This is one of those things a year ago right now we were sharing in the trifecta is the Santa Claus rally, the last five days of the year and the first two days of the new year. Yep. So again, back in 2022, early 2023, we were higher then. The first five days of the year were higher back then. I believe in and all that And then the January, and January had a huge return, up 6%. But you're down the year before. So this is the stuff that we were sharing <laughs> more than the other stuff we just talked about. So sharing, listen, maybe there's a washout. That's a psychology, Michael, we were talking about. There's this washout. Now there's a strength, there's a strong buying pressure. For whatever reason, it's happening. This is the real and, shit. And then you look at the previous years, literally never been lower up, what is it, 27% on average for the full year return. You got 54, 58, 61, 63, 71, 75, 95, 12, and 19, and then obviously 23. So these are those little clues, little nuggets that, that I try to find and found a lot of them this time of year ago, but that's a great one. And you Dude, know, what, what do we you get, 25%? Stacking, you were stacking this shit all yeah. up to 23. Yeah. I do believe this, yeah. though, and I do believe it, it's an artifact of like psychological stuff from mm-hmm. all of these years. But 
Yeah, look at this setup that we went in, like in hindsight, of course. But yeah. look at the setup that we that we went into twenty three with. Horrible year, down nine was nineteen point four percent. Right, horrible, one of the worst ever. And then bonds, let me talk about bonds, right? And then yeah. the last five days of the year, the market rallies, and then the first five days of the new year. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're of the bearish disposition, you would say, "Oh, they're about to rug us," mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like, "Oh, first five days are up. This is how they fool you." But if you're like somebody looking at data and you just say, "Well, does this happen frequently?" Turns out, not really. But the last ten times it, it happened. Yeah led to really good outcomes uh, for investors. One other way on this, remember we bottomed, I think it was October 12th or 13th on the S&P had that bear market. We had that CPI print that was hotter than expected. Market was down 2% at the start of the day, finished the day up over 2%. That's so I 2022, looked, right? Yeah, it was 20, yeah. October 2022. It was October 14th or 13th of 2022. But down a lot on that CPI print, finished up over 2%. So it had a 5% swing from the lows to where it closed, and it touched a 52-week low in the process. The day that happened, I tweeted out that I did the numbers. I mean, Bye. it happened, I forget the off the top of my head, but very, very rare. And normally, most of the time, it marked a major, major low. Not surprisingly, go back and find this tweet and look at the comments. I mean, just people hated that comment or that that statistic. And, and you never know. But then we had the rally and the rest is history, as they I, say. Dude, yeah. I, I, I love that. Let's talk about the setup going into now. I mean, going into it was six weeks in yeah. uh, for 24. It's obviously not exactly the same setup, but most— I still—I'm sorry to cut you off. I still have not acclimated to 2024. <laughs> like I, my brain's still not there yet. What do you mean? Like you don't believe that the new year started? No, like when I say when I go to say the year, I think I'm still saying 2022. Well, wait, not 23. You're still stuck in 22. Yeah, I think Ryan's rubbing off on me. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So, so what's this? What's the setup for for this year? So we got through the first. Uh, we got through the first earnings season of the year. Uh, we'll get we'll have a Fed meeting mm -hmm. a month from now. Pretty much everyone is now in the no cut camp. Yeah. There won't be any real surprises there, uh, I don't think, uh, unless they come out with a with a hike. It's like unlikely that that's really going to be a big market mover. Uh, how what do you what do you make of the current setup? Yeah, overall, I mean, you have to say positive, but I'll just I'll go this route. You know, when you look at election years, I mean, what amazes me amazes me just how some of the seasonality stuff has played out. So now you look at an election year. Well, you know, in an election year and a first term president. The last 10 times, the election year has been higher. So that's in the back of my head, knowing that that tends to be strong. We, we can get into the economy. The, the economy still looks strong. Um, uh, one of the big keys to us, and I know some of your previous guests have talked about some of these concepts, but we're, we're big believers in this. The productivity, right? We created eight million jobs the last two years in our economy. Yeah. And look at the jolt. Wild, People aren't way. quitting. People aren't really getting laid off. And I know some of the headlines of layoffs, but just today we saw initial claims didn't go anywhere. So let's just say people are happy where they are. If it takes a while to learn what you're doing for your job, you're not moving across the street. We think we're on the, the cusp, I guess you could say, of a major jump in productivity. I mean, we've had a 3.9% uh, annualized productivity the last three quarters. We haven't seen anything like that since the mid-90s. And you mentioned cuts, hikes. Um, we're we're not saying March is off. I'm sorry, March off table. May is off the table yet. We still have another CPI, another two CPIs, another two PCEs. But in the mid '90s, what happened? Well, you know, Greenspan saw this. We had very strong productivity back then. When you have strong productivity, it opens the door to pay higher wages. We had like 2.4 percent inflation in the mid to late '90s, and wages are up around four to five percent. That sounds kind of similar to right now. And if you have this AI boom coming and all the incredible infrastructure that we have going on, manufacturing, um, you know, huge jumps in manufacturing, construction, so 12 months in a row. A lot of these things are going on to us to say if we have a surge in productivity that is abnormal outside of a recession. Because normally productivity goes up in a recession. That's how it works. Everyone around you just lost their job. You better work twice as hard. But now we've got this higher productivity. And we think the chance for a couple cuts here, and again, maybe May, still a chance, you can cut. And you, what's the, why is the Fed worried? Well, if I cut, if we cut, inflation comes back. We haven't had a good track record with inflation lately. But we think with higher inflation, I'm oh, sorry, higher productivity, inflation stays under control. So that, that's a big key concept for us so this, this is year, how you, is good, okay. strong productivity. So this is how you could have economic growth without a worry over inflation. Yeah, the, and the Fed the, could cut, potentially. The ingredient mm -hmm. in the middle that you need is higher productivity. Yeah, and we're seeing it. I must be very clear, for three quarters now, we've seen it. Now, again, it could 
you could roll over. Uh, we don't anticipate that. Yeah. I mean, investment's such a big part of productivity because once you have a, a maturing labor force, an older labor force, uh, you know, where we've already made 8 million jobs the last two years, so it's going to start to slow down. That's fine. Then companies start to invest in themselves. What are we seeing? I mean, we're seeing incredible, like, high-tech uh, manufacturing has just been soaring. And that's a lot of that. Yes, that's the CHIPS Act. That's the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which really was about EVs and things like that. Those are things literally during the uh, regional bank crisis. Remember that? The 8% regional bank crisis last March, which which was very scary. You know, I, Crisis in lowercase. Yeah, well, you know, it's standard. Um, I work with a really smart guy named Sonu Varghese, our, chief, our macro strategist. He does a lot of this stuff. He was talking about all this really big stuff. And I, can I, we're allowed to use the F word on this, right? We, I want you to. Okay, fiscal policy. All fiscal right. policy. <laughs> See what he it did? upsets people. I, I'm not going to cuss on this podcast. This I cannot cuss on this podcast. <laughs> no, I'd like can't. to. Maybe maybe once you hit <laughs> uh, stop. Anyway, that's all right. But, I mean, fiscal, everyone's, ah, oh, the government, the government. And I, we get it. But some of these things that government's put in play are really good. The onshoring, bringing stuff back. We've talked about these concepts, but it's true. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, right outside of Columbus. Intel's building one of the largest chip facilities like in the world right now. And, and we just, we're seeing it uh, in I the just, manufacturing I just, data. I just got a text on that. It's already outdated. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I know they're halfway through <laughs> yeah. building it, yeah. but it's well, not it AI. Slowed down. It, yeah. Well, you know, but, but you're right. It's not AI, but they're just still, they're building chips so and, think, and the, the, how, there's how, technology coming. Yeah, go ahead. Is every company, Josh was talking about this with, with Walmart's earnings, is every company, I mean, the lines are getting blurred between industrials, retailers, and technology. They're all integrating it. Jensen was talking about it last night in the earnings call. Everybody is integrating technology in a big, big way. Yeah. If everyone's right. a tech company, then really nobody's a tech company. It's just, it's all tech. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, when I was recruited to Carson, they said, you know, we're we're a tech company. Yeah. First. Yeah. Then financial services. Because everybody, if you're not on the edge Let of Let me give you an example. It's a yeah. company. I own the stock. I'm not, it's not a, uh, not an endorsement. Sam Sarah. You know this name? I don't think I do. The ticker is IOT. Okay. So internet of things. Basically, this would have been classified, in my opinion, 10 years ago as an industrial. But yeah. it's, they call it a tech company. What does it do? It's kind of both. So every, everywhere that there is a company or a government organization or whatever that has a fleet of vehicles. Those vehicles either have gasoline or they're electric. Uh, they probably have cameras on them, mm -hmm. right? right? We're talking about equipment. We're talking about like, like anything on wheels. This is the property of a company. They need to track it. They need to know how charged it is. They need to know how much use is on it. They need to be able to see what's going on around it. Uh, if it gets stolen, if it gets moved by an unauthorized person, think about airports, think about, like uh, big wholesaling warehouses. Okay. So this company is making the software and some of the hardware for that level of ongoing monitoring of all of these vehicles that are part of infrastructure. That sounds very industrial, but they're using AI. So it's like kind of being called a tech stock. I don't know what it is. It's a $17 billion company. <laughs> they got to a billion dollars in ARR in eight years, which is almost unheard of. Went public at precisely the worst time, yeah. 2021, I think. Uh, so it like came public at the top, got killed. Now it's rallied all the way back. It's, a, it's to me, it's part of this industrial renaissance that's mm -hmm. going on right now that you're describing mm -hmm. that's happening in Cincinnati and Wisconsin and Arizona and all over America. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter what it is. Maybe the important thing is, like uh, Michael referenced Cintas, yeah. these stocks have charts that are going higher. Like, well, regardless of what industry it's in, business seems to be getting better. So here's what I was going to say to this. Um, I'm not a CFA, okay? So I, a I, little bit more about me, I, I traded options for almost 11 years at yeah. a shop in Cincinnati. I'm a CMT, Chartered Market Technician. So the way I was brought up to the world was supply and demand, relative strength, looking at market sentiment and those things. And believe me, I look at fundamentals and macro views too. But at the end of the day, if you tell me that literally I believe today – XLF made a new all-time high. IYT, trans mm. an all-time high. Industrials, XLI made an all-time high. That is the message of the market. I'm an old school John Murphy guy, right? John Murphy, message of the market. The market is telling us that the cyclical things have been leading. We've liked cyclicals for a while, so I'm being XLI very looks amazing. Yeah, I mean, and again, maybe it's, it's not vertical. maybe it's not as industrially as it used to be, but you know what? 
that's um that's nice looking and there's some strength there and again what 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 do we want to not see i mean if you're bullish i guess you don't want to see utilities leading staples leading we're really not we continue to see those at relative strength lows against the s p 500 we've seen that for a while um that is that is what the market's telling us and we can you decipher reference. what's an industrial or not but look but this, is, those the, are this positives. is the market relative mm -hmm. to the to the staples there you go markets yeah at an all-time high, yeah. and this ratio is crashing. Yeah, and that's what it's you want. Thing. If you're purely bullish, that is exactly what you You referenced that day last week where the NASDAQ had a really ugly day. Tuesday, yeah. But a lot of sectors were the beneficiaries mm -hmm. of money coming out of tech and going yeah. somewhere else. The somewhere else is banks, industrials, mm -hmm. saw healthcare get a bid that day. Yep. So there is no shortage of things to be bullish about right now, mm -hmm. which is kind of what – what I've been saying over the last week or two, just from a purely gut perspective, this concept that the market, quote unquote, needs Apple and Microsoft, what if that's backwards? Mm -hmm. What if the rest of the market can only advance when a half a trillion dollars comes out of those stocks and gets redistributed? Mm. Yeah, no, I, I I like that because, again, I kind of talked this already, but last week when tech was weak, we saw other groups. We said, oh, the market was down last week, but yet most stocks were up. Why? That's right. Because small caps and mid caps did really well That's right. last week. And this week, yeah, I know tech's taking it, uh, being the champ again today, obviously, but but nonetheless, it, it really is a broad-based rally in our opinion. And you can find some cracks. John, I know, John, you know, can you do this uh, working yet again? Zweig bread thrust? Oh, yeah. We can, yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. So that's a really good segue uh, into, into, into this idea. So a bread thrust, this is Marty Zweig, one of the greatest uh, technicians of all time, uh, RIP. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is when the preponderance mm -hmm. of stocks in the market all go up at the same time. Yeah. Or oversold first and then go up. And yeah. and then like simultaneously melt up. Mm -hmm. That's not a bearish signal. It's the opposite. No. Right? And I mean, again, I know we have it here, but just last year, we actually saw two of them. March 31st, we saw Zweig breath thrust. And at the time I noted, hey, you know, a year later, this is using data from Ned Davis uh, research, big fan of them. Since World War II, never been lower a year later for the S&P. Never. Never been lower. And then we had another one on November 3rd. A double bread thrust, a, a double if you will. Thrust for the year, which, hey, it is what it is, up 13.7% for the S&P three months later. That's the best three months after a breath thrust, or I'm sorry, wide breath thrust since, uh, what was it, uh, coming off of the uh, GFC. I mean, so again, these are the things that when I noted that in early November <laughs> of last year, come in, remember how scary it felt coming into the late October then, people hated it. And it was like, ooh, maybe there's something here. So again, these are just little nuggets, little bullet points that uh, Marty's wagon, you know, he's got the 10 or 11 things, which are amazing. It's, you know, the trend, don't fight the trend. And then number six is the, you know, don't fight the Fed, but he's like, Number one matters more, though. So even Zweig, people say, don't fight the Fed. That's true. I'm, I'm not saying fight the Fed. But again, to Marty Zweig, he would say the trend is really all that matters. Now, believe me, we follow other things. But if you but were bu powerful. If mm -hmm. you were bullish in 23, de yeah. facto, you were kind of fighting the Fed. The Fed was telling you, yeah. we're going to raise the cost of money, and then they did it. It was like, is, is this the interesting thing to me? If you look back five years from, from now, like people that weren't really trading – People that enter the market, they might get the idea that, oh, the NASDAQ loves rate hikes because we had the most aggressive rate hiking cycle ever <laughs> yeah. and a NASDAQ doing double the S&P up 50% on the year. It's like – it's kind of like where we get into this area of maybe there's not enough market history mm -hmm. – for us to really no. safely draw any conclusions. Well said. And of course, AI obviously boomed then too. But I mean, we were in the camp also that I mentioned inflation coming back. I know the Fed was very hawkish. We, we get that. But we thought eventually inflation was going to come back. We can talk more about inflation. But I mean, the bottom line is we, when we look at inflation, we just see so much of it is shelter. Barry's had people come on. We've all been talking about similar things. 44% of core CPI is shelter. Well, and Mike, you know, this. what is it, like 60% of people own their house and most of them have their house paid off. So does that should that shelter really impact everything? Everyone? Probably not. If you take out shelter, of course, CPI, the last three months, it's annualized 1.1%. You know, that's, that. it is what it is. And we started seeing some of that last year. I mean, for the last eight months, year over year, rents are down. If you look at apartment lists, that's the private data. Now, I know the government's data is still higher and we get that. Eventually, it's going to come back. But we thought there'd be a pivot uh, for the Fed. And there was, but I guess the pivot went officially to what, December of last year. But the market clearly sniffed it out. They hiked, I think it was July was that last hike. The market sniffed it out and inflation coming back was the clue. And that's, I think, you know. Playing devil's advocate, rally. though, yeah. if shelter is so outsized mm -hmm. in that popular measure of inflation, there's an argument to be made that the most dangerous thing the Fed can now do is to lower the cost of a mortgage. 
because mm. that component is really short-term sensitive and we could get a reacceleration of inflation just because of a bounce in right. shelter costs. Well, no, you're right. And I would devil's advocate or counter back the whole productivity thing I mentioned earlier. If productivity is as strong as, as we think it can be going forward, maybe you don't have that jump back in in inflation, um, so to speak. Again, kind of like, you know, what Mark Twain say, history and repeat, but often rhymes. Right? I use that all the time. I know other do. Mid-90s, we saw that. And I think there's some similarities now. I want to ask you about uh, the first rate cut, speaking yeah. of inflation. Yeah, so, John, there, we have yeah. this chart. Not all first cuts are the same. Okay. So there is a thing, there is a uh, a market meme right now that's fairly pervasive, which is that, oh, no, 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 it's not the inverted uh, yield curve that matters. It's when it uninverts. That's yeah. when the countdown to the recession begins. Or stated differently, the first rate cut of the cycle, mm-hmm. that's when the countdown to the recession begins. You point out S&P 500 returns after the first cut over the last 10 cycles. There are a lot of different stories in here. Uh, that need to be told, and they're not. It's not always the same result. It's not. But you know, mentioned yield curve. One thing I want to point out here: there's different yield curves. We all know that. But the two tens, kind of, when you say yield curve, that's what most people think. You guys remember what day it inverted by chance? Yeah, nineteen. Well, it was April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that up. April Fool's Wait, Day is when the two of twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, twenty nineteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. it, you can't make the no, no, no. The more recent one, twenty twenty one. It was twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. April Fool's okay. Day, twenty twenty one. It's been averted for a long time. Um, but the, nonetheless, nonetheless. But uh, what we're sharing here on the screen right now is the idea of there are different types of cuts, right? And when you have a first cut, we would argue this is a more of a normalizing cycle. And and those would be, you know, 20, remember 2019? Things were pretty good. The Fed hiked a little bit. Then the economy kept going. Yeah, this this is not a panic cut. This is not a panic cut. Holy shit, things are broken. And that'd be like, you know, what are the panic cuts? 87, Greenspan. 87 crash. Mm -hmm. uh, covid uh, COVID, I would, and then the Russian ruble crisis in October of or that, September. I was October so I was th- I was there for that. That was one hundred percent a panic cut. Yeah, because it was it was between meetings. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, and it was and it was more than twenty five bips, and it was specifically explained as this is because of things going on in Asia. Yeah. So that was definitely a panic cut. So All again, right. we don't have a hundred years worth of data or no. five hundred years for that matter, but we've got three normalization cuts and forward returns have been fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mid eighties, uh, eighty nine. You know. So Ryan, your your yeah. your data says that if you if you take the panic cuts, which by the way, twelve month returns Pretty after good. the panic cuts yeah. are, are plus seventeen percent by the panic apparently. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, normalization cuts, twelve month returns for the S and P average, thirteen uh, percent. Mm-hmm. Anybody would anyone would take that. The recession cuts are trickier. If the Fed they is cu- is cutting because of the onset of a recession. The twelve month uh, outlook is negative eleven, mm-hmm. so I guess you have to hope that the Fed's first cut is not mm-hmm. is not because they think the economy is meaningfully weakening and they have to do it. Right, uh, exactly. And hey, who knows? Might be to do this again in six months, and we say, oh, I guess that first cut was a recession. We don't think that's the case. Again, I mean, this cycle. What, what's driving this cycle at the end of the day? You know. Credit drove the 80s and 90s. AI. Well, AI maybe, but I think it's income. This cycle, we would argue, has been an income-driven cycle. And, and you hate to say, well, you know, what are the four most dangerous words? This time is different. Well, actually, the 50s and 60s, in our opinion, is the last time you saw income-driven cycles. It can happen. It'll happen again. I mean, clearly, we had a credit-driven boom before the GFC. Uh, you know, we've had that. But this cycle is a little bit different from that point of view. This cycle is being positive. driven by two things, Taylor Swift and sports betting. Well, uh, It's here's the another, only thing that anyone is spending any money so on. So here's another thing. I tried to buy Taylor Taylor Swift tickets, December of 22. I bet uh, on Taylor Swift. I eventually, did you, Say yeah, more. Yeah. I did actually finally get them, but that was the day Ticketmaster blew up and it took for, I, I, you, have I, do, you have daughters? Yeah. My daughter wanted a ticket and I, I got one. I did it, but I mean, I just you have remember. a 16-year-old daughter and do you have any others? Just one. Just 16-year-old okay. daughter. And Were you the hero sons. of the of the moment? Yes. She was okay. pretty excited, but it was this most stressful thing to buy that ticket. But uh, what I'm getting at, then, you know, I was joking with our shop. I said, there's no way there's going to be a recession. Did you try to buy Taylor Swift tickets? Yeah. Like, or go, you, we travel, get travel. I go to any steakhouse. Like, they're, they were packed in late 22. Yep. And I know about the inverted yield curve, right? But an M2 and these things. But just go out and try to buy a Taylor Swift ticket. It was impossible. It's a rolling Super Bowl coming that summer. And and I, I joke, you know, that you know, I think it's going to be Creed this summer. You know, be Creed. Creed's coming out this summer. They're going to they're gonna save the economy. No? Okay. Well, no. anyway. <laughs> yeah, I like Creed. But they're coming out this summer. I think they're going to keep things going. But but still, it's just that real world versus what the economists say in their books. And you talk about the yield curve. You know, Goolsby said it best well, a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, again, 
what's going on now? Well, th- th- there was a supply issue. And, you know, normally it's a demand issue. When the Fed starts to cut, the yield curve inverted because it thinks the Fed's going to cut. Well, now maybe it's just saying the Fed's going to cut and things are a little different because, again, this cycle wasn't about demand. It was always about supply. And that's why this inverted yield curve truly hasn't mattered yet. And I know every time you can probably find it. Hell, heck, I probably said it too. Oh, the inverted yield curve before GFC. Let's ignore it. But, um, there's other things that need to line up first. And to keep it simple, credit credit markets, right? The credit spreads. And what are credit spreads saying? And to us, last March, we didn't see credit spreads blow out. That's why we added some equity risk in late March when people thought we were a little crazy. Even in, in October, we were promised a credit event by some people. We didn't get that. And again, the credit markets are still fairly calm right now. In fact, they're very calm right now. But we're going to get a pullback eventually. I mean, you're on average, you get one 10% correction a year. Maybe you're going to get one this year sometime. But what the credit markets tell us, I think they're the smartest people in the room. I'm going to follow what they have to say versus is what any yield curve has to say. Do you think say. there's any truth to this idea that you have, like your, your anecdotal data is better than other people's if you're like a middle-aged dad? You just like, you're kind of like, or mom, mm-hmm. you're kind of like more in the economy than someone whose kids are already grown up and moved out and you don't have like as much necessity to spend the way that you used to. Because mm-hmm. I because I happen to just notice that people of our generation tend not to get as bearish yeah. on economic data as people in their 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. And I and I I sometimes think like if this guy could just be around like what I'm around when I take my kids on a vacation yeah. or something like and just see what I'm seeing, mm-hmm. like maybe this person's not living the right lifestyle to really have good anecdotal data on what's happened in the economy. I agreed. I mean, my daughter just turned 16, bought her a car. So now it's an extra 500 bucks a month. My insurance went from- about car insurance? Yeah, 2,100 to 4,600. But here's (laughs) what I'm getting at. It's worth every penny because now I've realized I don't have to drive her to school anymore. She's going. She, so it's like, okay, I'm paying more money. You, that's what I'm getting at. You talk about productivity. <laughs> I can I can sleep in a lot of days because she's driving herself to school. I didn't even used to do that. So so yeah, that's a playful way to look at it. But but again, there's some truth to that. And, yeah. and a, yes, going with your kids, seeing seeing things through their eyes. And so this summer it's, it's going to be not J, so bad. J Lo, uh, the the Jennifer Lopez tour will be like this yeah. this year's uh, Taylor Swift. I th- actually think Luke Combs is going to be the biggest tour this summer. Okay. Um, but nothing really has changed from last summer to this yeah. summer in terms of like the state of the economy visibly. Well, here's one thing that's, yeah. that's hasn't changed from this summer to last summer. Small caps still suck. And this is one thing that bears might be hanging their head mm-hmm. on. The Russell 2000 is still in an 18% drawdown. The year rolled over and a lot of people were bullish on, tw- on, uh, on the Russell 2000 coming into 2024. Yeah. It's flat on the year as in up six or 7%. Yep. Um, when the market goes up, the Russell is up less. When the market has a down day, it's down more than the S&P. What does the Russell need to like shake off the rust? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a Russell and there's also the S&P 600, which has more companies making a little more money than the Russell 2, which is a lot of companies that don't make money. But but just in general, I mean, we do like small and mid. Now, like I said, mid is probably our biggest outsized uh, portfolio bet that we have here. So I do lump them together. Um, but, you know, let's just put it in context. <laughs> Russell 2 had a 22% rally the last two months last year. Okay, that is like, if you look at the top 10 best two months ever, and I know I sent it, so I don't know if you John, got that John, we have this, the not, historic two-month surge yeah, in it, small caps. Wait, hold on. Ro- ro- while we're looking at this, Ryan, this is yeah. important. I didn't realize the extent. I knew that the 600 are, is not mm-hmm. the same thing as the 2000, the S&P yeah. 600. The S&P 600 is in a much smaller yeah. drawdown. Well, that's, and, and that's one, at least when we invest here, uh, Carson, yeah, we, we were actually the S&P 600 and it is, you know, a little- the Russell 2000, yeah. 25% of the components are not profitable. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, so there, so anyway, so- There's so, an industry difference as a result. So this is just another way to look at it. But again, we just had one of the largest two-month rallies ever. So what I'm sharing here is the 10 best two-month rallies ever for the Russell 2, 12 months later, up 27%, higher nine out of 10 wow. times. So Mike, what I would say there is we had a historic, end of your rally, I think small caps are kind of just biding their time right here, catching their breath. And we're still optimistic that um, they're still going to do fairly well. Uh, you know, and is it going to be this big rotation like we talked about earlier, Josh, from large caps to some other areas? Maybe, you know, maybe. But this, be. this is yeah. interesting because this is actually showing what happens to the S&P 500 after a giant small cap rally. Well, you know what? That's a typo then because it's Russell 2000. Sorry. Oh, it does okay. say you're, you're right. This is this is Russell 2 data. I don't so even know. Look at old Hawkeye over there. Good job. Nice job. <laughs> I don't even know yeah, if I It's Russell can... 2. Sorry. I don't even know if I could be be convinced that this even matters anymore. Yeah. Not that we don't want to see small caps rally, yeah, I hear you. but let's say they don't. Who gives a shit? Yeah. And people are making money. 
<laughs> but but like honestly, if Nvidia is a two trillion dollar company at this point, like what's the market cap of the Russell two thousand? Every company stacked on top of each other. You're right. It's like Yertles turtles. It's like yeah. it's a stack of turtles. Who gives a shit? I hope right. it fall, I hope it falls again. Right. The the stock market that people care about is in great shape. There's earnings growth. Not every company is growing earnings like Nvidia, of course, but like. These are so small at this point. These are we're talking about five billion dollar market. I mean, is companies. it a stretch? You could is it a stretch to say corporate America is on fire? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. No, I think I think, I think it is. I mean, I know, uh, you know, we've got a lot of debt in our country. We know that, but again, then you look at corporate America. I mean, I mean corporate unemployment America, less than four percent. Twenty four months in a row, I think. Margins like mm -hmm. near all time highs. Mm -hmm. Earnings at all time highs. Revenue at all time highs. Yeah. You know, one, you mentioned one thing, though. You said what's different or similar to last year. I would say one thing is different right now than last year, obviously, is we're we're well, just listen how we're talking, right? I mean, people people are feeling better. Look at the consumer confidence is breaking out to highest levels we've seen in a while. And I'm not yeah. saying that's bearish. I'm just saying that, that contrarian in me says, oh, you know, okay, okay, everyone's starting to agree. People are feeling a little bit He's better. Like, oh, Josh um, and Michael are getting yeah. all bowled up. Well, no, you know, no, 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 I gotta, no. I gotta, yeah, I you eat, had me on your podcast uh, finally. I'm like, a, I'm a huge bowl all last year. I'm finally yeah, yeah. on your podcast wearing a happy birthday Josh shirt. You know, what I mean, come on, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this has got to be. I got, I got we, we bumped yeah. you for Grantham. Yeah, you that was the tell. That was the tell. I got an email last week, uh, Ben and I got an email. You guys used to be more balanced. Now you're all bullish. Right. And I was yeah, like, well. well, we're talking about the stock market and it's going straight up. What mm. would you like us to say? Yeah. Well, true. Um, oh, um, don't, don't, don't believe it. It's going to crash. Get out now. You have a right. couple, you have a couple of, uh, seasonals that I want to do. Stocks tend okay. to do better in early February and worse later. Yeah. Which Let's, clearly is not working at all right now. Uh, this but, is um, January effect. Is there anything worth pointing out here? Just that when January's higher, the yeah. full year gains almost 17% versus if January's lower, you're up about 2% on average. So again, it's just it's fairly wouldn't ignore it. I'd, I'd, I'd throw it in the, that's bullish for this year. And uh, this, is, this, is this is the chart here that I put together. Clearly we're rallying today as we do this. But historically, the second half of February, and even into St. Patrick's Day, especially in a uh, election year, tends to be a little bit weaker. So just be aware of that. I know, full, you know, egg on your face today with the rally we're seeing, but just be aware of that. Also, when you gain 20% the previous year, like we just did, you, you were in that March, April timeframe, February, March, April, you, you tend to get a little consolidation. Perfectly normal, right? I think it's perfectly normal. Uh, John, put up the Carson cycle composite. Yeah. So this is one that I, I put together and it looks at the average year, the past 20 years, year four of a presidential cycle, year four of a new president, the year after a 20% gain and a positive January. You smush all that together. And I used this last year repeatedly in a different scenario for last year and it worked wonderfully. So right now, again, potentially some chops, some churn into late March would be perfectly normal for a year kind of that we're seeing right now. So again, yes, we're still overweight equities. We have been since December 22, but we'd be open to the idea that, I mean, the S&P just went up 14 out of 15 weeks and gained more than 20% during that 15-week period. In the history of the stock market, that's never happened before. So let's, you know, <laughs> let's put some things in context here that the little pause would be perfectly normal. You were saying, you were saying like, if your prediction is another bear market this year, yeah. statistically, we've never seen. Well, I mean, Ben just wrote that blog on it, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, three three yeah. in a row would just be so far outside of the, the data that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, election years exactly. tend to be weak early and rally late. This is consistent with uh, with JC. Yep. And uh, you'll see him later tonight. Uh, but just this general idea that so far, we're actually doing better than a typical election year. So yeah, like we're, we we're running far ahead. Not well said. And you know, I mean, election years, um, Sam Stovall's got a joke. I don't know if you've heard it before, but if the opposite of pro is con, and the opposite of progress must be Congress. Oh, that's a good one. Very so that's good. A good say. Anyway, but yeah, I know I've got the chart on elections, but I think it's really interesting because about people say who wins and who loses, what's it matter? Of course it matters, but I think the makeup of Congress matters more. We took a look. You know, we've got a split Congress now. We know that. Smallest majority for Republicans in 140 years. Democrats have a very slim majority in the Senate. We get it. The last 13 years, you've had a split Congress. Take a wild guess what the S&P's done. It's gone higher. Maybe it's random. Maybe it's not. But that 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 division we have you, to get anything done. Look what's gotten through uh, from Congress lately. Well, infrastructure that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, the onshoring. Let's bring stuff back. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the inf uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which again wasn't about inflation. It was about EVs and batteries. But still, that's that's been really positive. So to get anything through, and I think when this election's all said and done, of course, who you voted for matters. But the makeup of Congress to um, 
to the listeners and everybody out there, it might matter more. And I think we're still going to have a split Congress, all things considered. If it's not, it's yeah, not going to be a major wave. It doesn't seem like there's going to be any kind of— Yeah, there's the chart there. Yeah, that's it. I mean, split, you do a lot better <laughs> historically than if you have a you know blue wave or red wave in the uh, in the, in the Senate, I don't even see Congress. this show up mm-hmm. on people's list of risks for the stock market, like yeah. uh, who wins. I just— right. It, it doesn't seem to be a really big factor. This not yet. Time. People yeah. don't like that there's an election, just given like the rhetoric that comes along with elections. But I don't feel as though this is something that the stock market is particularly concerned with. And at let's least be honest, yet. what's the stock market not like? It's it's the uncertainty, right? And we literally probably going to have two, president, two, two ex-presidents or one current president, one ex-president running. So it's not going to be a shock, whatever their policies are or aren't. I mean, you know, so that's kind of where – Now, you know, I, you, True. we're seeing some in the news now. Look at what you guys think of this. I mean, if President Trump were to win, going to go after China more, could there be trouble upsetting another trade war? We all remember 2018. I mean, February 5th of 2018 – what happened that day? Well, that was the first day that Powell took office. Also, the Dow dropped 4.6%, the worst first day ever for a Fed chairperson. It also was the start of the trade war. 2018 wasn't very good with that trade war. Now, I don't say it's just because of the trade war, but that didn't help. I, I mean, forgot what do you think there? that he yeah. kept Janet Yellen mm-hmm. in place for like a year and a half. Yeah. I totally right. forgot about that. Right. Yeah. That was hilarious. Yeah, and Janet Yellen, the shortest Fed chairperson ever, but I think she was third in terms of market returns annualized. So she did a she did a great you just job. Just picture him like yeah. tell this lady to lower rates. Right. She yeah. won't listen. All right. Who 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 are we bringing in? <laughs> uh, you talk about the consumer being in the best shape, and I, I don't yeah. want to spend a ton of time on this. Yeah. This is really what the stock market is. Yep. It's a it's a bet on the U.S. consumer, the U.S. Mm-hmm. stock market. Mm-hmm. This is where all the market cap resides, pretty much. Is like, is there going to be, I know the global economy is important, blah, blah, blah. But like in reality, the engine for earnings is the U.S. consumer. And that probably hasn't changed over the last couple of years. If anything, that effect might be even more profound. Yeah, I mean, listen, we hear about $1.13 trillion in credit card debt. Everybody talks about every quarter that data comes out. And that's a lot. I'm not saying I'm a fan of all that debt. But there is a lot of equity out there. And I don't know if they've got the chart or not. But, you know, we, we did take a look. And, which and a one? Lot, I, don't, I don't even know which one. I've seen a few consumer ones. Um, I have consumer John, borrowing. Co- John, it's the 47th from the bottom. Yeah, there's, <laughs> you know, there's too many charts. I have yeah. household incomes. I have consumers yet to stretch their borrowing capacity. Yeah, exactly. The one I really like is household balance sheets, assets, liabilities, net worth as a percent of disposable income. I mean, I think that one, because you think about net income, what is net income? Well, it's li- assets minus liabilities. Right. But okay, big deal. You got to normalize it. So we normalized it by disposable income. So to keep this fairly simple, we think we have a lot of debt and we do. But if you look at it, guys, based on disposable income right now, Liabilities as a percent of disposable income is a hundred percent. It was a hundred. There it is. There's a chart. It was ninety eight percent in nineteen ninety nine. So yes, there's a lot of liabilities, but there's a lot more income that's happening right now, or disposable income, I should say. That I think you you normalize it, and then when you take a look again at what we're seeing now, we literally have you know record wealth, right? We know that. Um, so record assets subtract the liabilities, and again normalize it based on disposable income. You could make the argument, and I guess we have been for a while. The consumer is actually in some of the best shape they've been in, at least since the late 90s. And then all this debt we have, yeah, it's not crazy about it, but there's a there's a record income. I mean, what was um if you the, the uh $17.5 trillion in debt, that's that data that comes out you know, every three months is E.1 from um uh, New York Fed. $17.5 trillion of debt. Okay, it went up about $988 billion last year. Mm. Disposable income was up $1.33 trillion last year. Nobody talks about that. You could argue consumers actually were less leveraged, and I would make that argument, less leveraged than they were the year before, even though we added all this debt. And again, a f- not a fan of the debt. I'm just saying you got to look at it. And, and you guys on Animal Spirits listen all the time. Thank you for citing a lot of our stuff. I mean, you guys cited this too, but like credit card utilization, if that's how much you're using relative to your balance. And I've got that chart too, but it's like 24% right now. Okay. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It, well, this is the big one, bad. This yeah. is the big bad chart thing that everyone's worried about. Yeah. Uh, well, this one here is actually cre- credit, credit card, card debt. Yeah, credit card debt relative to disposable income, and it's a five and a half percent. It was eight percent before the GFC, and it was you know running even higher before the um, before. What's the, the number the, here? Six. At six and a half percent, we're back to the average. Yeah, just the average. So we're below average again. Credit card debt relative to disposable income. So that's that's not the story. Also, you know, that's not the story we hear. But hang on, going back to the the liabilities. Yeah. Mortgages. Yeah, technically it's a liability. Technically. 
But that's not like a, that's not toxic. That's like an no. asset too. Right. No, exactly. I know and it's classified as a liability, but come on. You're right. You're, you're, exactly. What and is it? What is the, how many people are, are defaulting on their house right now? Not many. Nobody. Not Nobody. Many. And literally in the fourth quarter, bankruptcies went to 114,000, 113,000, went lower in the fourth quarter. U.S. bankruptcies dropped in the fourth quarter. It was running at 200,000, okay, before uh, COVID, pre-COVID. So, Again, are we seeing these spikes in delinquencies? Yes, in some cases we are, but it's a spike. Maybe Here's, it's normalizing relative to where we were before the uh, pandemic. There are parts of the economy where you could poke at, for sure, sure. as you always can, that things mm -hmm. are maybe a little bit shaky. I think the only credible bear case right now is that things are too good and, yeah, I, and everybody's right. bullish. And that's, mm -hmm. okay, fine. I'm not saying that's not a reason, but that's that's a, that's tough. Mm -hmm. That's a tough reason to actually one of the be recurring theme, One of the recurring themes on this show a lot of the people that we have on, especially people that are chief strategist types, they will remind us and themselves in the audience, things don't change that quickly. And one of the things with financial media in general is like everybody wants the new narrative, the new story, what's next, what's next, what's next. You could have a period just go on for a long time with no change or only minor changes. And that feels like this. Like, when's the recession? It's like, all right, well, how many years are you going to wait for it yeah. before you just acknowledge, like, life is is passing you by? Like, we're just, we're not in one, okay? There needs to be a catalyst. It's not going to be the True. rate hikes. We digested them. There has to be a catalyst mm -hmm. to knock us off course. Mm -hmm. And maybe there will be, but it's hard to see right now what that is. No, you're right. And again, you know, you think about, well, maybe the most, re biggest reason to be bearish is because stock market's doing well and people are bullish. That's not, that could just be a normal eight, Five to six percent are, and like you said, Mike, how, how bearish everybody gets on that. Historically, that is mm -hmm. a terrible reason to be bearish. Yeah, that's why I'm not bearish. I mean, yeah, exactly. Big picture. <laughs> exactly. I'm bearish yeah, because right. everyone else is in a good mood. Yeah. That's, well, that's some weird that shit. That doesn't make Hey, did you have fun on the show go. today, Rye? Uh, I, I did. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, this was a blast, guys. Thank you. I know, Mike, you gave me like an open invite like a year ago. It took me a while to get here. Maybe it's a signal. The fact I'm here for short term markets, Top, but uh, there we go. it's all right. This it's all right. It. But no, this, this, this is a blast. Now, look at for the Bulls. Historically, Every time Ryan is on the uh, Compound and Friends, we'll find yeah, out what here happens it comes. three, here. six, 12 months later. Thank you, here Ryan. Here it comes. Yeah. So we keep referencing tonight. So t this is, I yeah. guess, technically my birthday show. Yes. And uh, tonight we have like 100 people coming to hunt and fish. And uh, this won't go up till tomorrow, so I can say this there you go. On, the, on the air. Uh, but I'm really glad you're in town for this. Who are you, who are you most excited to see tonight? Now that I've seen you, uh, Howard, I, mean, I look forward to seeing Howard. You he's won't see to, him. Oh, he's not coming. He has a leak in his roof in San Diego. <laughs> what? I swear to God. Well. I swear to God. He was supposed to be sorry. here. Sorry, so here's This is the most Howard thing ever. He sends me and JC a text at like 6 in the morning. He's like, hey, guys, I have something wrong with my roof. I can't leave San Diego. Uh, I'm going to send my daughter to the party. <laughs> oh, wow. <Okay. laughs> Instead of Rachel, right. which, is, which is great. Oh, yeah. But that's a very Howard text. That, that is. Uh, who else? You see Phil? Yeah, Phil. Uh, I never met Dan Ives. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Fami. Fami. Oh yeah, Fami. I mean, it is. It, I saw the list. It's amazing. And by the way, so can I just do one promotion? You, you, you know, I want you to. Okay. So I do have a, a podcast, Facts versus Feelings. We yeah. do want to do it with uh, Sonu Varghese. It's not all too different than this. This fun conversations, and we're doing a live stream next week all on right. Thursday, and we have Dan Ives. We have uh, Libby Cantrell, we have Kathy Wood. Um, you know, we've got some some oh, really that's a, that's yeah, a nice it's, lineup. It's, it's going to be it's going to be a really good, really big time lineup. Uh, Neil Dutta also from Rinmac. Uh, we've yeah, got yeah. those four. So for four hours, we're a live stream. You can follow over on my social medias. You can go to carsongroup.com backslash or oh, slash cool. Leap Day and sign up for. It. But that's that's on Leap Day. It's so they're not all on at the same day. time. You're going one, one hour, conversation exactly. To the next. Eleven a.m. The noon, the top of the hour is a different person for four hours. Son and I are interviewing those four, four people. Hours. Four, four hours. Four hours. Yeah. Hours. I don't know how. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. We have some DoorDash delivered or something. Stretch a little bit. Do you get a break? Yeah. Do you get a, like a yeah, little five-minute break we, in we've between? We've got some little, we got some little 10-minute breaks in the middle there. But it, it'll be um, a lot of fun, and I love doing that stuff. And I love visiting with you guys doing it again. Yeah, so, man. so this is awesome. Well, that's a great lineup. Let's tell people more about your uh, your podcast. How often are you putting out episodes? Yeah, so it's called Facts versus Feelings. Every week we do it, usually Wednesday mornings when it comes out um and it's it's been really popular growing and it, it's good and of course i'm on twitter at ryan what's uh, what's the new like oh he's awesome he's yeah. one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet but also one of the most down-to-earth normal guys and we shared a lot of his charts just today on this show and he okay. looks at the macro stuff i look at the technicals but yeah he's amazing great a great personality he's he's uh he's, he's my boy he, he's awesome we're, very we're, we're, very we're cool so he and I have a lot uh, of fun together. shout out to Sanu. 
All right. So uh, we'll, we'll have everybody check out the facts versus feelings. Uh, why'd you name it that, by the way? Just because I think it made sense, right? Because I like to look at facts, but feelings matter. We were dealing with people's investments. Feelings matter. Um, but I would still say I side with facts more than more than uh, I like, anything. I like it. But facts versus feelings just made a lot of sense. We've been we've done I think seventy two or seventy three of them so far. And okay. again, our first live stream this sleep day, which would be awesome. That's that's so yeah. great, man. I, I love it. I love I love seeing you. Uh, out there doing your thing. Anytime you're on TV, I, I tell people this, you're a volume up guy for me for sure. Well, thank you. And uh, I think you do a great job. Uh, we always close the show every week with favorites. And we try to give people stuff that maybe when they're not looking at markets and the economy, like something else mm -hmm. to pay attention to. So what are you into these days? Well, I will say I saw some previews for Shogun on FX. Oh, it looks, it, it oh, looks I'm, amazing. I'm going to watch it, that. It looks really, really good. When does that start? I think the 27th, I think, of this uh, month. Week. So soon. It starts soon. But people that have seen it say it's pretty awesome. Looks so really that's good. good. And I know I'm a little delayed in this. I finally finished The Crown. I really enjoyed finishing that. Um, that that That's a show, good show. It's very off-brand for you. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that what one is a little. you in The Crown? Um, I don't really know. I okay. just started watching it. I just kind of was into it. Now, I, I'm Michael and I would probably watch a lot of movies together. I mean, we I like over-the-top action. I love The Beekeeper. I know that came out a while. It's the, the most popular popular movie of the year so far. Yeah. I will. I haven't seen it Beekeeper's yet. awesome. You'll love it. It was, it was awesome. streaming? You can do no, it now. You can do okay. it on streaming now. You can pay for it or, or buy it. I guess yeah. pay-per-view at home now. But Beekeeper with Statham was so amazing. I couldn't stay with I loved it. I couldn't stay with The Crown more than like three or four episodes. There's like no martial arts. Well, that's true. <laughs> no, there like, is no martial very little. arts. It's That's like true. a little bit. Yeah. And they do end it like in 2005. So I kind of thought it'd be cool. You know who did the tour. costumes for The Crown? Who's that? Sintas. Really? <laughs> there you go. That's why it's not so. <laughs> <laughs> the uniform. <laughs> the uniforms. So on the flight last night, um, I, I only watched the first 30 minutes, but I could not believe, could not believe how good Blackberry was. Mm. Uh, and really? So I, could, I was shocked. It's like the founder good. Remember the founder really? with Michael Michael Keaton? But it, well, it's a dramatization of what? Of the story of research and motion? Yeah. So, I, I again, I only saw the first 30 minutes, but super duper duper. Why is it so good? Did you see it? Yeah, it was one of my favorite movies of the year. What? So, it got a 98 by the wow. – I just saw it this morning. It got a 98 from the critics and a 94 from the audience of Rotten Tomatoes. It's spectacular. What happens in it? The first 30 minutes, it's just – it's incredible characters. Some nerdy founders, one super nerdy – uh, genius founder and some shark CEO that comes in to take over. Incredible writing, incredible acting. It's it's really it's so unexpected. You have to watch it. What service is it on? I was on an airplane, but I'd probably stream it anywhere. Okay, BlackBerry. All right. I, I when I saw this come out, like I no, I'm, I think I'm good with that. But cannot recommend it highly enough. Have you seen it? No, I've not, but I think I need to. Awesome. Yeah. All right, True Detective season four finale. Mm -hmm. They landed the plane. They, That's a contrarian take. No, they did. It was fantastic. It was six, uh, The whole thing was six episodes. Everyone that or I know hated it. Well, <laughs> I can't speak to other people's taste. I would just tell you, uh, Jodie Foster is phenomenal. All the actors are, are really great. They didn't lean on a lot of celebrities. Most of these actors you've never seen in anything before. I, I, I didn't. I just, her relationship with Navarro just didn't, I just didn't buy it. There was nothing there. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I thought that, uh, they had a tough task to do because they don't have the creator involved anymore. And the creator is actually rooting against it, succeeding. Oh, really? Yeah, Nick Nick Pizzolatto uh, apparently was like sh uh, shit posting about it, uh, the new season. Well, I think ending a murder mystery is almost impossible. It's almost yeah. always a letdown. And I, so I, I said this on the podcast with Ben, I didn't like like the ending, but I but I didn't, but I enjoyed watching the show, if that makes sense. There's a couple of things with this. One of the things is I like movies where they spend time on atmosphere and ambiance and not every scene necessarily moves the plot forward, but they'll just, they're, they're almost, you almost feel like you're escaping into another world watching it. I appreciate that when showrunners or cinematographers or film directors do that. They, they took some time to do that in this show so much so that as you're watching it, you're not like on your phone. Well, like, that's you what I'm feel saying. immersed. So I, I, so I agree with that. But you have to watch it, first of all, at night. Second of all, in the dark. Third of all, can't have a phone in your hand. You, you either surrender to it and you join the world that they create for you or forget it. Don't even bother. And I felt that way about the first season of True Detective. You felt like you were transported into this world that the characters inhabit. They did that really well with this. And Alaska is a f***ed up place. 
like no no offense to our Alaskan listeners, but it's perpetual night at this time of year. And so that's you have to like be in the right frame of mind to watch the well, show. Well, to your point, Josh, it is it is a show that I watched at night with my phone off. So I I enjoyed watching it, even if I didn't love the ending. But let me ask you this for for the end. So there was nothing really supernatural about it. Like, no, that's the point. Right. It, so that was a nice misdirect. That's the point. And they and they successfully did that again. They I think with True Detective, I think the job that HBO Max had was to bring in a showrunner who could go back to what made the first season so magical and try to recapture that because seasons two and three didn't work. And the thing that the first season did was it started out, you thought you were in the presence of supernatural forces, but then by the end, all of that was explained by like real world phenomena. And I thought they did that this time really well. So anyway, uh, I can't recommend the the season enough. Uh, Also, I think I'm a Bill Ackman stan. Now, did you did you listen to uh, Lex Friedman and Bill Ackman podcast? No. Nope. What the f*** are you talking about? I think I love Bill Ackman. You <laughs> listen to the Bill Ackman Lex Friedman podcast? I, I listened to the whole thing. It's three and a half hours. Wow. I'm I shocked. I really. This is more shocking than your True Detective take. Why? This does not seem like a thing that you would do. It's so good. What if I tell you I'll pay you money to listen to it? I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Wait, say no, how much. Fine. Say more. Go on. What if I t- what if I tell you, what if I tell you that either Bill Ackman is Academy Award level winning uh, uh, chops as an actor? I don't. That's, or, not, that's not true. Or you genuinely believe, as he relays these horrible experiences that he went through, and then and then gets back to the triumph of of more recent times. But like he tells a story of like. 2014, 15, 16, 17, just being annihilated by life. Hmm. Like literally, Carl Icahn blows him up. Then Paul Singer comes along and tries to put him out a bit, force him to liquidate. Um, then he gets divorced. Then Valiant. And it's like one mishap after another. He owns all of the mistakes that he made leading up to it. It doesn't seem like he's acting at all. He Like he genuinely makes you feel how he felt in those moments. And then the comeback is so good. Okay, I buy that. Leading up to those moments during the Herbalife saga, he was such a colossal, arrogant prick. And he says that. Okay. Do you know what he did after Valiant? So he He, was humbled. He called for a block of granite and a chisel, and he put his investment rules into, into rock, and he told the people that were around him who probably also suffered as a result of his decisions, if you ever see me deviate from these core principles again, hit me with a hammer. And ever since then, what has he done? He went back to his knitting. He's an activist, but not in the sense of, let me get into a fist fight. He's like an activist in a good way. He owns companies that he actually likes, like Chipotle, for example. Who told you to listen to this? This is not, this does not sound like you. I like Lex Friedman a little, a medium like him. I don't, so, so I don't, I don't, I've never listened to his podcast. I don't, under, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I, Where a, did this guy come from? I, I, I almost was professor at MIT. No, really. That's why I, people I can't, listen. I can't listen to it. I don't understand. He just he, – he, he came out of nowhere, and now he's interviewing Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos. What he happened? Sent, How right. did he do this? He sent all these emails saying, I'm a professor at MIT. Come on. No, seriously. I'm literally telling you the exact story that happened. He sent all these emails during the pandemic saying, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, very successful people, when they get something from somebody who's in the faculty of MIT, they're like, yes. So he got these really great interviews – he also has this really interesting deadpan thing that he does, the way he asks questions. His tone is always very even. He doesn't get overly excited, and he's willing to listen to anyone. So he'll have people on that are somewhat controversial talking, and, and he'll let them talk. And it's disarming, and it's charming, and people like it. And he's not the only person that hit upon this. There's a, there's a girl named Bobby Altoff. You know who that is? Okay. She's like, she looks like she's a 14 year old girl, but she's actually uh, married or now divorced. She got a Drake interview. It makes no sense that she was able to get a Drake interview. She does interviews like literally on Instagram, but she just sent him a DM, shot her shot. And he said, yes, it was part of his rollout for his last album. Ever since then, she's gotten like every hip hop star to be on her show. She does this deadpan like uh, uh, style of question um, like interview style, people are like so disarmed by it because she doesn't sound like anyone else. All right, DM Jim Simons right now. 
No, I'm just making the point. There are people that are doing that are doing content very differently from like a mainstream media uh, approach, and it's really hitting. And Lex is one of those people. People really like when he talks to he had Bezos. Yeah. Like, anyway, how did he do it? He figured out it's very effective to put MIT in the subject line. People say yes, and then it feeds on itself, and it's like it, it became a thing. And now it's like. Oh yeah, of course Lex Friedman's gonna get uh, Putin and Elon and all these people. Of course he is because he he just he became he went from zero to Lex Friedman like overnight. Yeah, but that's dope. It's kind of crazy. I think that's fly. I like people that invent themselves. I'm one of them, so I, I respect I respect the hustle. Anyway, Bill Ackman's great on this podcast. He tells all. He's it's, he's very charming. I know he weaponizes that charm sometimes, uh, or is notorious for having done so. But honestly. If you listen to him tell his own story, it's really good. Well, you know what? I will listen to Bill Ackman tell a story on this podcast, on this podcast alone. Uh, I don't think he's coming on our show. <laughs> but Put MIT on the subject line. He might. Uh, that's, a, that's you know no, what? MIT professor. You go, crap, yeah. crap, but, <laughs> hey, man, thank you so much for coming. We, we, we think the world of you. I hope I made that very clear to the audience. We want everyone to follow you. Your LinkedIn, Ryan Dietrich. You're on Twitter at Ryan Dietrich. What's your OnlyFans? Yeah, you're you're on all later, the you're later. on all the things. You did a great job all of last year. I hope you'll be right again this year. Thank you so much for coming, Duncan. We have time for one review. You want to go ahead and read that for okay, us? Okay, yeah, I've got a good one. Uh, Steve Z says, "Absolutely fabulous! A tour de force. Engaging, mm. entertaining, educational." Best podcast. Thanks, Josh, Michael, and team. I was going to say, is that a Lex Friedman review? <laughs> no, it's All for right. us. All right. Hey, guys, if you haven't left us a review yet, wouldn't this be a great time to do it? Tell us how great the show with Ryan Dietrich was. We would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for listening. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>